Welcome, everyone, to the Corn Brief Podcast, episode number 14. This is your open source for digital currency news. Every week we talk about the latest news in the cryptocurrency space, especially relating to Bitcoin. And uh, so last last weekend, a uh, story broke shortly after we released the last podcast, so we're going to talk about it in this one which is uh, some celebrities' uh, iCloud accounts got hacked um, and pictures were stolen from their accounts. Uh, the pictures were of naked naked celebrities and the pictures were sold on 4chan for Bitcoin. And it's a huge, huge privacy issue that has is blown up in our culture. And right now everyone's talking about it. And definitely... A really, really horrible situation for those celebrities who had their privacy invaded. Um, it's, it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's bad for them. But it's, it's, it brings up like interesting conversation that like everyone in the culture should really talk about and be aware of the privacy implications of this, and how it relates to the cryptocurrency space. Of course, is that the hackers originally sold the well. At first, they were likely trading the pictures between each other because the pictures were hacked by different people most likely um and they they traded between each other like i have i have kristen ritter's picture uh she was in the bathroom and, and i and i hacked her icloud account and got her picture i'll trade it for your jennifer lawrence picture and there is this secret society secret like society of hackers <laughs> right brotherhood yeah <laughs> the the brotherhood of fappening hackers <laughs> and one of them kind of realized like wait a second these are these are pretty huge like valuable pictures i can sell these for a profit on 4chan for bitcoin and that's what they did started collecting like donations and once once the bitcoin amount hit a certain level they would release the photo to the public on on 4chan and that's basically the prevailing theory of how this happened and like since then there's been great pieces done by by people on mashable for instance mashable.com there's this journalist who basically proved that with just like a 200 dollar like underground program called efFB or something like that with that you can basically break into people's iCloud accounts and with some clever like uh instructions and and you know minor hacking skills you don't have to be a big time hacker to do this with just a program and some hacking skills you can break into an iCloud account and steal pictures which is pretty nuts and Apple's on the defensive right now trying to say that they're gonna improve their security in the future so um, good thing or bad thing for the Bitcoin community uh, does does this does this show that like we that there's a lot of potential in Bitcoin for, like, I, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like that that it's a good thing they got their their pictures hacked, but it it kind of it's it's kind of it it shows like a disturbing part of the free market almost that people can do this and and then sell it for Bitcoin. I don't know what what do you what do you think, Evan? Um, well, if you are my honest opinion, I think this could possibly be the best thing that ever happened to Bitcoin. <laughs> and my to my ever reason, happen to Bitcoin. My reasoning behind that is I saw a thread on Reddit, and it was at the top of Reddit. It was at the top of the front page, so you know it was at you know it's it's legitimate. It's a credible source. So, oh yeah. So um, there was a huge spike in search volume for Jennifer Lawrence leak nudes on Google. Okay, yes. and since. Since Bitcoin is involved in it, whenever whenever these people who are searching Jennifer Lawrence nudes, they would read the article and they would read that it was sold on 4chan for Bitcoins. Like, well, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to go and get on 4chan, and they're going to be disgusted and they're going to run away. And but then they're going to Google Bitcoin, and so that's going to that would lead to a spike in Bitcoin searches, which we know. Um, is strongly correlated to the Bitcoin price. The more Bitcoin is being searched on Google, the more people are buying because social awareness and interest in it is going up. Yeah, a certain percentage so, of those people Googling it, even if it's a small percentage, are going to buy some Bitcoin. Yeah, so, if this has the impact that this totally legitimate source on Reddit 
um, which is a totally valid news website. If this happens, if people start searching Bitcoin more and more because of the nudes, we could see the price go up. Yeah. So far, that hasn't happened, and the whole thing is dying down, so that's probably a bad theory. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if, if last year is anything to base our judgment on, it takes, like, uh, usually around a couple weeks for, like, news to really have an impact on the price, if it's going to have an impact at all. It doesn't happen instantly, but at this point, we're, what, we're, we're a week. We're a week into this, like, scandal and the Bitcoin price is pretty steady right now, around 475 or so. So it's, I think, there's a lot of other factors at play at the price, too. There's a lot of, you know, there's, as we've talked about before, there's people who, you know, exchange their Bitcoin for products on 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 uh, Expedia or, or Amazon or whatever, through gift cards or Overstock or whatever. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of factors at play, so I don't know if the fappening will have like a, a huge impact, but for at the very least, it increases awareness, increases awareness a lot of of people kind of figuring out that number one, if they have heard about Bitcoin before, it didn't die when Mount Gox went under. It's still around. It's still going pretty strong. The ecosystem itself is stronger than ever, and secondly. It enables transactions between people across the internet, types of transactions that we've we've never really seen before in the history of the world. Uh, like now, people are actually people have access to these private pictures that they stole, and are giving it up to the public in exchange for this digital currency. You know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's something that has never happened before, and pe people have never been able to do before. So just that fact alone, that there's this new functionality en enabling people to transact directly, peer to peer, uh, that's huge. And people learning about that is great. Increases awareness. Yeah. So, um, just to be clear with our viewers. Uh, we, me and Sean both agree that uh, Jennifer Lawrence nudes are great for the Bitcoin price and that uh, the more nudes Jennifer Lawrence leaks on the internet, uh, the more valuable Bitcoin will be. So just keep that in mind in the future. Yeah, yeah. That's, don't put uh, words in my mouth, mister. Calm down. As the, as the fappening progresses. But, uh, but on a more serious note, you know, you, you brought up a good point about um, this being a scary feature of the free market, um, of having an unregulated free, unregulated free market. But I would actually have to disagree because um, obviously it's theft. It's a violation of, you know, private property, which is, uh, you know, the central tenet of, uh, of, of free markets. It's immoral. And so, um, so there's definitely, you know, a valid case for for legal action obviously um you know the free market doesn't uh doesn't require there to be no repercussions for violations against private property um you know a, a, f a true like fully functional free market would actually have uh you know legal systems in place to protect people who had their property violated so um so this is you know it's definitely an example of what can happen on a free market um, and it, Bitcoin definitely made it a lot easier because it's harder to track than, you know, say PayPal transactions. Like yep. if this guy, if this guy had started, you know, like a PayPal account and was like, well, if you send me enough dollars, I'll release some, you know, it definitely would have been easier to track them down. Um, but, uh, but like all in all, it's, uh, it's really not something that we could use as a counter argument to the free market because um because yeah it's just a you know private property violation but you know this brings me to an interesting point uh it's more of a it's more of a social issue it doesn't really have much to do with bitcoin but i've seen some people on the internet saying that uh that hacking into phones and stealing naked pictures of girls should be a sex crime do you have any opinion it should be a sex crime. Yeah, uh, like, like some kind of sexual assault. No, that's ridiculous. No, of course not. Yeah, I would. <laughs> I have to agree. I saw. Um, you know, well, you know, this this obviously comes from the Tumblr feminist community. Um, oh boy. Yeah, and it's. I I think it's. Um, 
So when I saw this, I, I thought it was kind of ironic and self-contradictory because um, these, you know, these feminist people, they, um, they're constantly saying about how, you know, the female body shouldn't be sexualized. It's just, you know, it's just a human body. It's natural and whatever. But then, yeah, but it's also um, sexy. But then we have this thing with the fappening going on where people are having naked, where women are having naked pictures of, of them being stolen. And the same uh, Tumblr, the same Tumblr feminist crowd is saying, well, she's naked, so obviously it's sexual, so it should be a sex crime. Um, you know, I, I don't think they really so, understand the definition of what a sex crime is. Yeah, that that just kind of like it's kind of kind of indicative of the logic they use. You know, it's not really very sound. Um, but I mean, no I, doubt, it's a huge inv- violation of privacy, and you could make make an argument that it's like a virtual assault almost. It's a virtual assault on their privacy, but like sex crimes are physical in my mind and and i believe in the legal system as well sex crimes have to be physical a physical assault uh either like a rape or a molestation by a person physically um if you can't really you can't rape someone over the internet to my yeah, knowledge yeah I, I agree with you but you know i have to keep in mind that uh this you know, this bunch of people, they're a very small minority, but they're also very loud on the internet. And, you know, they these are the same people that think that um, staring at a woman in public is, you know, sexual assault. So, you know, it's not it's not like we're dealing, you know, with extremely rational people here. But mm-hmm. but yeah, um it like if like if you want my personal opinion, like in no way is this, is this a sex crime. Like, um even using, you know, the feminist logic just because just because it's a picture an image of a naked woman doesn't mean it's sexual so we we can't consider it a sex crime on the basis of the girl being naked right um but it's definitely a huge property violation um and private property was stolen and um and, and well there's people who argue well it's not theft because they just made a copy of the picture um, but then, at the very least, they're still um, breaking into somebody's property. It's still, you know, like a breaking and entering. Yeah, and they broke, these people broke in, when they, they broke took, into the people's phones. Yeah, when when these people took these pictures, they don't. They had they had no, you know, I- indication, no no purpose of like releasing it to the public. They thought they they were the only ones seeing it, and possibly just their boyfriend or husband. Uh, and. I think that I don't have an iPhone. I haven't had one in a while, but apparently when you pick, take a picture, it's uploaded automatically to iCloud. Mm-hmm. So it's not like they, they had any intention whatsoever to show this to anyone else in the world. So the fact that it gets stolen off of iCloud where they didn't even, maybe they didn't even intend for it to be on iCloud and Apple just chose to do that for them based on the default settings of the iPhone. And then boom, their privacy is hugely violated it, and huge wrong has been done to them. And I understand if they want to go after legal recourse. And now, you know, the FBI is getting involved, uh, trying to discern who hacked into iCloud, discern if if any serious criminal activity was committed and where they could, whether they can get, go after this person. And also, like you mentioned before we started the podcast, uh, so, there was Michaela Maroney, uh, she said that the pictures of her that were stolen, she took those pictures when she was a minor, when she was under 18. So now there's possible child pornography laws yeah. coming into play as well. And that, that ratchets up the seriousness of, of this situation as well. So, I mean, it's it's a huge mess. It's a huge mess. And, you know, whatever. You know, it's it, it'll, 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 all, it'll all get uh, sorted out eventually through the legal system and as well as Apple making security improvements, which really needs to happen. And also people need to get educated more about security and, and securing their photos. Like I would say, don't, don't default upload your photos to the cloud at all. Like if you have to save space, maybe back them up to the cloud and like encrypt them or something like people need to get educated about securing their own da- data especially if they're going to be taking naked pictures yeah i've never had an iphone before i've always had um android so i don't really know 
anything about the iCloud. But when it, when stuff like that, where there's like options to automatically back it up to the cloud, I always opt out of it. Because, um, you know, once you put it on the cloud, you have no control over it because it's no longer uh, on solely on your property anymore. Yeah, it's on um, Apple's servers. And yeah. It's pending like, on um, Apple. Like, if they had had it just on their phones and it wasn't on Apple servers, um, they could have had, you know, some kind of... Um, a lot of people on the news who were talking about this, they've been talking about two-factor authentication. It's been around, you know, for a while. Um, I first learned about it with Coinbase because, you know, they used to... You can use two-factor authentication with them. But, you know, you like... You have your password, and then there's an extra layer of protection where um, you go to like a third party that like randomly generates a, another PIN number or something that you have to put in, or you know maybe that you some get different from your kind phone, of, right? Yeah, yeah, that's how it works with Coinbase. Like you have your password for your account, and then you can get a third party app on your phone that randomly generates a PIN number that you then put into the login screen. Um, you know, it, it might, it you know, it's probably different ways to go about doing it, but. Um, yeah, people, like you said, people have to educate themselves on uh, on securing their information on the internet, and you know, like never put anything on the cloud that you wouldn't want getting out. Because like if if these pictures were just on their phones, uh, you know, there's a good chance it wouldn't have happened. Because right. this guy didn't hack the actual phones, right? He hacked like iCloud. He hacked Apple servers. Exactly. So, yeah, it's um. It's definitely, definitely some publicity for Bitcoin, whether it's positive or negative, you know, yet to be determined. Either way, but, it increases um, awareness. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this is much bigger than, than Bitcoin. It's a huge, you know, it's a really gross violation of privacy and like a big breach of like private property. So. Yeah. And it's a huge learning experience as well for basically anyone who uses smartphones or uses any any type of cloud service this is just doesn't go just for iCloud like learn how to secure your stuff on Dropbox Google Drive all these all these options out there none of them are truly secure like I I've I made this point on Twitter when the happening happened as well like uh, we've we've known for a while now that the NSA basically has all this data already all the, all this data in the cloud they pretty much have access to it and these hackers just put it out in the open for everyone so you know that that's that's another angle like the nsa is like the original privacy violators <laughs> like sure get 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 angry at the hacker for for leaking this out to the whole world but you've got to realize that the nsa has been watching this stuff for a long time and they keep it private for themselves there's actually a snowden released a story that said that <laughs> The NSA passes around yeah. nudes like between each other. Like baseball cards. Right, right. Like, oh, wow, look at this one. Yeah, oh, my little God. Little trophies. Yeah, and I bet and, they pass um, around celeb nudes as well. Yeah, and you, you, can't, you can't trust companies like Apple and Google to protect that information because as much as, as anti-NSA as they try to appear, um, I know, I, you know, I read Google and Facebook – um, at the least, there's probably even more companies. Actually, you know, they voluntarily gave up their information to the NSA because the NSA offered to buy it from them. <laughs> yep. You know, like they had a huge profit opportunity from it. So, you know, you can't eat, regardless of how anti-authoritarian or, you know, pro-individual liberty these companies try to be, uh, you know, like the biggest ones are putting your information up for sale. So, you know, you have yeah. to be careful what you put on the internet you know that's always been true but now that we know about this huge you know giant monolithic nsa um organization yeah the nsa on one side and the hackers on the other side yeah, as well it's, it's either it's one's going to have more, your information it's even more important now people really have to start taking advantage of encryption and um two-factor authentication and just you know basic security measures and make your information safer absolutely you hear that people secure your info unless you want it getting sold on 4chan for a bitcoin <laughs> it's not worth it <laughs> all right so let's uh move on to another topic so also this week the open bazaar beta has officially released to the public open bazaar is the decentralized online marketplace that has been recently developed by their by their amazing team 
Uh, it was originally a fork of the Dark Market Project by Amir Taki and Cody Wilson. And since then, that was in early spring, since then the Open Bazaar team has improved upon that idea, uh, released an actual uh, working network to the public now. And while people are discouraged from making big transactions uh, on the site, or it's not even really a site, it's a network, um, they are encouraged to test it, uh, put up small, small listings, and try and see, see how, how well it works. Uh, it's it's an interesting experiment. I did an interview a couple of weeks ago with Sam Patterson, who's the ops lead for Open Bazaar. Talked about how some of the various features work and how they're implementing it. And now the the beta is officially here, and uh, people like I I I strongly encourage people to go on and test it. I've been playing around with it a little bit myself in the past week, and it's pretty pretty interesting. Uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit complicated to to get going. It's not as simple as uh, just visiting a website or opening up an app uh, on on Mac, for instance, I have a Mac. Uh, you've got to open up uh, the terminal application, uh, have command lines, and uh, follow follow Sam Patterson's instructions. It's just like a five step process, but you've got to like download the Open Bazaar code from GitHub uh, through terminal, and uh, yet you have to start it and stop it with terminal on Mac as well. So you got to have a, a little bit of technical technical experience to get this going, but I, I, that's probably a good thing because that way you only get people uh, testing it who kind of know what they're doing and what like bugs to look for, and hopefully people who will report those bugs to the developers as well. So pretty pretty uh, big development in the marketplace community. The Open Bazaar shows a shows a huge amount of potential and we just got to work out work out the bugs, help them work out the bugs in the coming months f before their official release in December of Open Bazaar 1.0. I was I was reading their post on um, the Bitcoin subreddit when they, you know, released it a few days ago towards the beginning of the week. And and yeah, it's by it's by no means ready for people to actually you know start businesses on and and things like that. Um, you know they they pretty much you know like you said they they were upfront and they were like you know your bitcoins won't be secure on this on our network right now, so don't use like anything you know that you would miss if you lost it. And um, you're also not anonymous yet on there. Your your IP address is displayed for everyone to see whenever you're on the network so um, they, they have a lot of work to do you know this beta is more like people going in and finding bugs so they can help so they can help uh, the team you know straighten everything out so right um, are they using are they using test coins yeah you can use the Bitcoin test net as well uh, yeah. I, I actually I tested out their proof of burn uh, which is which is a uh, interesting way to like show people on the network that you have a good reputation and that you're on, you're an honest actor, you're not just a scam artist. Is by basically they give you a Bitcoin address, and you can send Bitcoins there, small amounts probably, like especially especially now. Um, but I spent I sent just like one one millibit to that proof of burn address, and it. Everyone can see that you burned that. They can see the amount that you burned, and that those bitcoins are no longer available to anyone. Uh, although you can you can send it to a charity, I believe, if you want to, you can send it to a charity and show people that you donated to a charity. But it basically, it's an innovative way for merchants to show customers that they're they're dedicated to this, that they're a legit actor, and. I, I used a real millibit for that to just to, to just test it out and yeah like whenever I log in now um, that's that still shows there like that I that I burned that one millibit of coins and people can see that as well like oh wow you know this this guy is uh is legit um, is willing to sacrifice some some money to prove that they're an honest actor so that's I, that's one of my favorite like features of Open Bazaar as well I I don't I can't think of any other marketplace darknet or otherwise that has implemented like a proof of burn system for reputation. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm really excited for Open Bazaar. It, you know, I hope I hope some really big businesses get started on Open Bazaar. 
Uh, I, yeah, I know a lot of people when they, you know, when they first think about it, it's like, oh, you know, decentralized Etsy. But um, I thought you were gonna say drugs. Yeah, well, you know that too. Drugs, yeah. drugs, weird porn, you know, handmade crafts, arts and crafts projects. But I, I really want to see like actual like you know businesses that handle lots of money and get in on this. You, obviously, we're not gonna have you know any overstocks or anything like moving their entire business to uh, to open bazaar. But I want to see people like build businesses from the ground up that can't yep. be touched by anyone. I, like that's the potential open bazaar has, you know, I, I hope it reaches that potential. I don't want to see it just become, you know, a huge decentralized market for drugs and porn. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the reason that, you know, is possibly likely to happen is because th that type of market isn't served that well by the overall mainstream market. So that's why people uh, who transact with, with drugs or you know other gray market areas are attracted to this kind of thing because uh, it it does it it will be anonymous it uh, will be un untraceable if you cover your tracks you know use I think they're going to implement Tor to make it anonymous and you know people have this outlet now where they didn't before you know the state oppresses them and doesn't allow them to transact freely. And now, now they can, or or even not even the state in in a lot of cases. A lot of marketplaces regulate their their customers and their merchants and tell them what they can and cannot transact with. I mean, eBay is a great example. eBay tells you what you can and can't sell. Specifically relating to Bitcoin, a long time ago they wouldn't let people sell Bitcoins through eBay, and you know, we've needed this for a long time. Basically, we've needed like a, a totally free online marketplace where anyone in the world can connect directly to each other and literally sell and buy anything they want freely without any rules uh, just person to person setting setting agreements between each other and basically creating a brand new free economy that's that's through the internet yeah speaking of uh you know the porn industry i heard about some like Department of Justice um, operation going on and don't quote me on this because I'm probably like completely off on this because I heard about it a long time ago I didn't really research into it but they're like there's some kind of like operation where um, they're either targeting like porn stars or escorts or something and then they're like trying to get their banks to like lock those people out of their bank accounts to just like discourage whatever it is either porn or prostitution or something yeah um you know it's so that that's gonna it if i was accurate at all in that story i probably wasn't but um you know if, if stuff like that has actually happened it's definitely gonna drive people to um to do you know sell you know sex industry things on open bazaar um that you know of course that's what's, what it's gonna start out as more than likely because um, you know those are the type of people who are already looking for that kind of platform. Yes. But um, you know that I, I hope it doesn't stay there. Like if you go if you go on the dark net, you know through Tor, they have all these um, you know they have all these marketplaces that would have a lot of potential, but they're all used for drugs. You know, and um, I just see it as. Uh, you know, a lot of potential that isn't being met because you can do so much more than you know sell drugs with technology like that. Yeah, yeah, that 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 only happens because yeah, there's there's this huge untapped market that that is looking for a place to freely transact. But yeah, it's Open Bazaar is totally open to any kind of products, and it'll be interesting interesting to see like what kind of crazy new like products that people can come up with and and sell on there and it's not even necessarily physical goods either it can be services you can create contracts with people uh for services and and be like okay you'll you'll pay me you know fifty dollars in bitcoin for you know my video editing services or you know my consulting services you know like let's start up a skype call and i'll and i'll give you a tutorial on how to do like search engine op optimization or, or you know something like that and and get get paid in bitcoin and like have it go through open bazaar and gain reputation through that and and 
you know, have, have contracts between people. There's so much potential. It's, it's really ridiculous. And it's in really crazy potential. Um, I just, I, I, I want to mention, I want to mention basically what I think is the first, the first store to really open on open bazaar is pornography, uh, of, you know, not surprisingly, um, she goes by the name Sexy Saffron, and basically she she makes like customized videos of herself, like you know doing various things that you can think of, and she's willing to like you know you can do a contract with her on Open Bazaar, and say kind of what you want the video to be like, and she'll do it, uh, and and be paid in Bitcoin, and like that's that's like that's a revolutionary new kind of a uh, like agreement between people in commerce that has never really happened before and it's enabled by this decentralized technology and it also like improves the privacy of the people buying that material as well because normally to get that kind of stuff uh you've got to go to like a centralized website and you know if you want to pay in fiat which you usually have to do or always actually you have to like give up your credit card information or PayPal or whatever, and your identity is automatically linked to it. And now, just paying Bitcoin, person to person, boom, you're done. It's free. Yeah, this also this also reminds me of an article I read today, actually, on um, the Reason Magazine's website. It was a new study that was done, um, and it was like forty to fifty percent of the of the labor force in the United States actually. Um, do some kind of freelance work wow. and uh you know it it see that it ranges anywhere from doing solely freelance work which is i think what the majority of that of that portion of the labor market was to doing some kind of freelance on the side in addition to um you know like a full-time contracted day job and open bazaar would just be you know a huge outlet for these people to go to because um you know it's you know, it's almost like specifically catered for freelancers because, you know, you can you can do anything you want. You can, uh, like, advertise anything you want on there. And so it, it's probably going to end up being a great place for, you know, um, freelancers to go and even people who are looking for freelance work to hire. So, you know, that's just a, a thought that came up in my head. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, free, freelance is this huge, like, I feel like, I mean, it's, it's always been out there for, you know, years and years and years, but it's kind of like this, it almost feels underground still because it's not really like a mainstream type of profession that people really talk about that much or go into that much. And the, but the statistic that 40 to 50% of people in, in the country are involved with freelance work is pretty amazing. And those people just need, you know, better like mainstream ways to get their work out there uh, to people who would be willing to pay for it. And, you know, there's been some websites that have sprouted up in the past few years to kind of support that kind of economy, F like Fiverr.com, where you can go and sell work for five bucks here and there. But that's a centralized website, and there's flaws that come along with that. And that's the kind of thing that Open Bazaar is going to possibly hopefully make obsolete in the coming years as it gets more popular and as people start using it more yeah i just looked up the article and um it it's actually 53 million americans which is 34 percent of okay. the of the labor force so um but yeah i didn't i didn't realize freelancing was um you know that that uh that popular you know, whenever I whenever I thought of freelancing, uh, freelancing, I just thought it was like you know pocket change. Uh, you know, I knew there were some people who made a living like doing freelance photography or journalism or something, but you know that's not a very big portion of the market. But a lot of people doing it, you know, f like full time basically. Uh, Twenty one million people identify as independent contractors, and like their their main ac according to this article this category of freelance workers their main source of income is freelance work mm. and um like you know me and you we're free we're freelance journalists uh you know we don't have you know binding contracts with coin brief we can float back and forth between you know various websites um 
and you know of course we're like we're not like getting rich or anything uh, and, and, i wish you know, we're not <laughs> yeah like it's, it's not it's not enough to, like we can't we can't like support ourselves having a nice house and paying bills and things like that but um you know it's it's not bad for you know considering the market that we're facing as you know like uh young 20 somethings you've recently graduated college and i and i'm and i'm halfway through and you know there's not really much opportunity for us but there's this huge freelance market now yeah uh, that we can take advantage of yeah i and think Open that Bazaar like going an outlet for that going going to that point like uh i i read an article earlier today or i i think i saw it on twitter an article that said you only need ten thousand dollars to be richer than most millennials in this generation just ten thousand dollars to be richer than most because like our generation just doesn't have that much money it's uh we don't we don't have the same kind of like uh jobs available to us that were available to the last generation like the last generation it was relatively obvious what you you know could kind of do with your life to be successful you're just getting a job stick there for you know 10 15 20 years or whatever and uh you'll have a nice pension set up for you when you retire and everything will be set for you you'll, you'll have a great salary enough to like buy a house and support a family and drive your car around everywhere and it's just not the case anymore it's not reasonable for people to do that now yeah and also if if you were uh in college and this is like 70s and 80s and you know into the 90s if you were in college and you made it through all four years, you know you were guaranteed, pretty much guaranteed a job after graduation, unless you're just completely lazy and you did no networking whatsoever. Um, uh, you know those people obviously didn't have a job, but if you were like, if you put forth a minimal amount of effort and got to know some people, you know you had a job offer by your senior year of college. And now I recently saw a statistic. Um, I can't remember what it was, so I'm like I'm not even gonna try to guess what percentage it was because I'd be way off. But it's over half of college seniors in America don't have a job lined up lined up post graduation, mm -hmm. and so you know those college seniors are gonna graduate with their bachelor's degree. You know, average debt is like twenty three thousand mm -hmm. dollars, so they're gonna have you know tens of thousand dollars in debt. They're gonna be working at a fast food place for minimum wage. Yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. That I mean that that just highlights the need for people to learn the the various like different ways that you can make money in the new freelance economy basically. Like you've got to you've got to be an octopus. Put out your tentacles everywhere. <laughs> Put, pull in this income from various different places and, you know, it's not going to make you rich and who thinks you're going to get rich off this stuff is is crazy. Uh, but it's it's a way to basically support yourself more, support the people you care about more, and it's pretty much necessary. If you're working for if you're working a minimum wage job, then you pretty much have to do something else on the side. Uh, and Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are enabling people to do that more, to do stuff on the side. It's giving people more well, options. Uh, well, you know, bringing it back to Bitcoin, uh, if you have you know, we we don't make that much because you know we're, we we're journalists. Basically, we we write articles. You know, um, we don't do programming know, work, which is where yeah, the lucrative money. Yeah, is. that's that's what I'm getting at. If you have any kind of programming or like web development skills, um, you're pretty much, you know, you're pretty much priceless on the Bitcoin freelance market. Yeah. If you go to if you go to like Coinality or Jobs for Bitcoin, which is a subreddit. Um, everybody's looking for developers for their it's like either bitcoin projects or altcoin development and i've seen um most of them are freelance but they pay like really well yeah. and i've seen um jobs i've seen job postings for developers apologies to our viewers we had some connection issues a moment ago so kind of ended the freelance talk right there uh so we're just going to move on to the next topic right now which is um, Ethereum, which is in uh, a new cryptocurrency, not even really a currency, but a new crypto platform uh, that was created by Vitalik Buterin. Probably butchered his name right there. But, uh, you know, him and his team have created Ethereum, which is a new decentralized platform for creating contracts uh, on a Turing complete 
blockchain and uh, it recently concluded the Genesis sale of the first like the first amount of ether which is their uh, unit of, of transacting on the network they completed the sale a few days ago and they raised over 15 million dollars just in Bitcoin in exchange for like I think they started out with 3,000 ether for one Bitcoin at the beginning of the fundraising and then slowly like every couple weeks or so after that they lowered the amount of ether that you would get for one Bitcoin but now it's concluded about it's it lasted a little over a month and they made 15 million dollars raising money for Ethereum which uh, there there was a submission on the Bitcoin subreddit that links to a Wikipedia article and the Wikipedia article said that Ethereum based on that 15 million dollars is now the most crowdfunded uh, project or the second most actually behind like some gaming platform second most crowdfunding project in the history of ever like uh, 15 million dollars for this and yeah interesting news what do you what do you think I think it's uh, it might be one of the you know first successful altcoin IPOs you know um, altcoins who do who have IPOs in the past have gotten the reputation of you know being scams or pump and dump schemes. Mm -hmm. You know, so far that that's not the case with Ethereum. You know, people are people are actually excited about it, and it seems like they're doing you know pretty interesting things with it. So um, it's I mean, fifteen million dollars is a lot of money, especially considering yeah. that that it's you know some cryptocurrency thing. Yeah, and when you put it in perspective, like Bitcoin companies, there was a lot of hype when Bitcoin companies would make like ten or twelve million dollars in venture funding, but now like a competing crypto platform has raised fifteen million dollars in I wouldn't even classify it as, as venture funding. Like the mm -hmm. the people who funded this aren't really expecting to make a profit. If they are, they're probably gonna be mistaken. But the they basically you know, gave this money to the Ethereum developers saying, here, take this, um, use it to, 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 you know, feed yourselves and support yourselves while you're developing this great platform. And in exchange, I'll get 3,000 Ether, which might or might not be worth that same amount when they actually uh, open up the entire platform to the public. But, like, they get something in return, you know, they can do, they'll be able to do something with that Ether when the platform is released. And maybe even create like their own their own you know platforms on top of Ethereum. There's all kinds of stuff you can do with it. It's really crazy. And like I, I encourage our listeners to have an open mind, and do some research on the potential of Ethereum. We've done videos in the past about about, about this as well, about how you can create you know you can create your own currencies on top of Ethereum. You can create your own like markets and and laws and contracts. Basically, like any any type of agreement or ledger that can be created by humans can be executed on the Ethereum blockchain. At least that's what that's the idea. That's what they're promising. And I, you know, fifteen million dollars. I guess I can understand it. It's it's pretty popular. And like they 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 didn't they don't have a pre mine or anything. Or they're gonna have a pre mine, but the pre mine of of ether is determined by the amount of people that funded it in the first place they didn't decide how much ether there's going to be beforehand they decide now now that they know how much funding they got and i don't know the exact amount but you know three thousand times however many people donated and that's what's that's what's going to be on the ethereum blockchain yeah i think they're really smart about doing that too because i uh, um you know like you said at the very beginning, you could get a bunch for one Bitcoin, but then as uh, the IPO was starting to wind down, they, you know, contracted the supply available. So, you know, so essentially, uh, they engineered like a deflationary IPO because you know they they kept the price, or I'm assuming they kept the price of one Bitcoin or whatever it was, the same, but then yeah. just offered less coins for it. So, um, you know, they basically engineered a deflationary IPO. Where, um, the, like, the, yeah, I call it a currency because it's one well, thing that's what it's going to end up being, but um, you know, I'm not an Ethereum expert, but they, you know, they 
they made it to where the ethers they um, just like ended up going up in value towards the end of the IPO. You know, most pre mines are like, okay, we're gonna pre mine like a million of them, and then people buy like a hundred thousand of them, and then you have you know this huge inflation because they're just you know. There's the still all those people. coins in existence. Yeah. Just because they aren't in the yeah, public like the on the market yet doesn't mean that they aren't going to in the future and inflate the overall supply. Yeah, it's like uh, like the majority of the of the supply people don't even want. So you have to you know basically give them away for free. But that didn't happen with Ethereum. You know they're really smart in doing that, and yeah. um, I definitely think it's interesting. I think it could, uh, you know, like this. This like teamed up with Open Bazaar combined with Bitcoin, like it's just this whole like digital, you know, business ecosystem that can emerge from it, and it's like, it's like, we're like we're officially in the 21st century, like this like this is the future. Yeah. Uh, like I'm I'm not saying like Ethereum is the future. I'm not like trying to you know like pump it like trying to be a shill for them or anything. I'm just saying like, the technology. Uh, like surrounding these these projects, like you know, this is crazy. Like, yeah. and it's it's all it's all decentralized too, for the most part. Yeah, and, this could um, be like this could be the defining in invention of the 21st century. Like, I used to think that about Bitcoin. Like, this is, this is the defining invention of the 21st century. This is the one world currency that everyone will be able to transact with, assuming they have, like, the technological tools to, to execute transactions on the blockchain. But yeah, now that we have all these other... <clears throat> excuse me. Now that we have all these other crypto platforms out, including Ethereum, those could be the future now. Like, who knows? It could be any of these crypto platforms. And, uh, like... If you can execute any any contract on a blockchain, decent in a decentralized way, like that puts lawyers out of business, uh, you know, like it 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 puts like so many people out of business who whose services aren't necessarily efficient or you know good for the market anymore, and basically it 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 could free up those people to do different things with their time that are more productive in the new 21st century economy. So I mean it's it's we don't even know like how this is going to truly impact society. We're just talking about like the the very vague possibilities, but like the fact that these possibilities even exist now is pretty amazing. You know, me and you were talking about this the other day um about like you you could start a business or some kind of organization uh, right now with this technology and have um, have no physical like physical office location. Um, everything could be entirely done over the internet. All the meetings and things could be done on Skype or Google Hangouts. Um, the yeah. mission the mission statement, the budget, uh, and uh, you know the general like basic structure I, I call like I called it a constitution but articles of incorporation that's what it is when you start it when you start a corporation um, it could all be done through like uh, you know it, it in the past like the recent past it was Ricardian contracts but now it's like you know it could be ethereum smart contracts which is based on Ricardian contracts and um, like all the funds could be controlled through multi-sig uh, mm -hmm. so you know it's you can't have one person just like going, you know, crazy with power, and um, but it's just since it's all digital, like expenses would be so low that you know your overhead would be virtually non-existent, and you could, you know, you could allocate ninety to ninety-five percent of your resources to actually, you know, like selling the thing or providing the service that you yeah, want or improving it, yeah. innovating on top of it. Yeah, and it would just like it would just create, you know, this like this super innovative, like super affordable, highly profitable, um, you know, new like species of business. Yeah. And like, it's that's just, an interesting way to put it. It's new species. That's yeah, more efficient, like, natural selection right there. Like, it's just, it's just insane. The possibilities, you know, we've been in the 21st century. It's 14 years in the 21st century. And, um, like, I We're think we just we've getting started. Yeah, I think we've made more progress in these 14 years than, like, the entire 20th century made. You know, yeah. 
like you, you think of the you think of the, like the major technological innovations of twentieth century, like you know democracy, electricity, cars, you, you know, all those telephone, become, TV. Like, yeah, like. Even, even now internet, we have all of that combined on smartphones, you know, basically. Yeah, you like even internet is kind of becoming outdated in a way because you have these people who have these like visions of a decentralized internet. Because yep. you know, um, internet right now is centralized at the point of access, which is why we've been having problems. You know, with like all these ISPs, like you know Comcast and Windstream, trying and all to those. throttle people. Um, and and like in four in fourteen years, um, we've basically you know built the basic foundation. And now we're starting to develop it, and it's going to like render a hundred years worth of technology obsolete. <laughs> and like we we've, we've done that in fourteen years. It's pretty crazy. Yeah, and the people who got rich off that original technology or innovations won't necessarily be happy now that they're becoming obsolete. They're probably just yeah. going to ignore these new platforms for as long as possible until they go the way of the dinosaur. Yes, and like we're gonna like you're gonna get because of that we're gonna get a lot of resistance from governments and things like that who are you know catering to the special interest. Yeah, you know the people like the old like the old money. You know they're not gonna go willingly. They're gonna they're gonna do whatever they can to keep the old, like the old systems intact. But yeah, you know it's not gonna be easy to do that. All right. Well, um, speaking of you know old money versus new money and people clinging to their old perceptions of what money is supposed to be. Uh, you know, last week we talked about the controversy or made up controversy of Bitcoin journalists owning Bitcoin and whether it's ethical for them to have Bitcoin and, and cover it in the news as well. And, uh, you know, that this conversation is, is still, is still going around in the, in the community. Um, uh, recently Vox.com, um, did an article where uh, their one of their writers, Timothy Lee, uh, talked about how you know he was he was buying two thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin, and and you know treating it as an investment. He wanted to buy it to see if the price went up after he bought it, make some money off of it. But then they reversed their position. The editor of Vox.com, Ezra Klein, uh, changed his mind and told Tim Lee to. Uh, sell sell his two thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin because, you know, it's they think it's 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 unethical. You know, they they see it as like a like a stock that you're like you're invested in a, in a company, and if you're invested in the idea of seeing this thing become more valuable, then your coverage of the news will be slanted that way. And, you know, af after that happened and I read those articles and, and had some discussions on Twitter about it, um, I'm, I'm revising my position a little bit uh, fr from my article that I wrote uh, last week about this. And I, I think that, yeah, if, if someone does ha have $2,000 in fiat and they buy, you know, four Bitcoins or, you know, e even even more then I do think that that can possibly distort their reporting, depending on the person. Different people have different principles, right? But, you know, some people that might distort their thinking and cause them to maybe write a couple more Bitcoin articles than they would normally write, you know, or maybe maybe cover just the good things going on in Bitcoin and not the bad things. Um, like, my my main position was that if you treat it as a currency and not an investment, if you just transact in it, if you sell stuff for Bitcoin, either products or services or work that you do, then you don't really see it as a as um as an investment. You don't you aren't biased towards it because you're just using it as money. People aren't biased towards the dollar just because they use dollars. They, it's just it's just money for them. It's just transacting value. But yeah, if I I, I do I think now that for some people especially, you know, people who are focused on making money all the time, you know, uh, they, it, it can, it can color their reporting a little bit, especially if they normally report on just generalized, uh, technology news. Like we're, we're, we're a special case in, in the, you know, in the Bitcoin news world. Cause all we talk about is cryptocurrencies pretty much. And that's what coin brief is. That's what all these, you know, coin desk and, and all these people, uh, mainly talk about cryptocurrencies, so like it's it's hard for us to be biased in favor for people to claim that we're biased in favor of cryptocurrencies. Well, 
because we cover them. It doesn't matter if we're biased in favor of them or not. We, we cover them all the time. But, you know, it's I, at the end of the day, I think that every news outlet has to make their own choices on this call, uh, make their own calls about whether they want their journalists investing large amounts of money into cryptocurrencies. Like, personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even invest $2,000 into Bitcoin right now. There's problems that I, that I see with it. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't plop $2,000 down on Bitcoin right now. I enjoy getting paid in it, um, cause it's, it's quick and efficient and I can sell for dollars if I want to, but like, I wouldn't invest in it right now. Um, but for people who do do that, you know, it's, it's, it's up to those individual news organizations to like allow that or not. And another point is like for these writers who like maybe not necessarily want to be restricted in what they can invest in or what they can buy or not. Like, maybe just don't tell your editor that you're that you're buying Bitcoin. You know, just it's you're allowed to keep that private. And you know, it's it's kind of it's a wild, wild west right now uh, in terms of journalism to see like what what people can uh, buy and, and invest in because Bitcoin's a gray area. It's not a company. It's a decentralized network. It's a decentralized platform for currency, and. Uh, I don't know. What, what do you What do you think? Well, I have I have two issues with this uh, Vox situation. Um, one, I actually I read the article from Tim Lee that said, um, you know, I'm investing in Bitcoin now, and you know, the editor is letting me. Uh, he he wrote the article talking about you know the ethics of owning Bitcoin and writing about it. Uh, you know, the, the journalistic ethics, and then but then he went on. Like the entire second half of his article is like why Bitcoin is such a good investment, um, uh, you know, so, so he, <laughs> blatant. But he was like, is is Bitcoin a good investment or not? You know, like I'm gonna list some pros and cons below, and it was like all like all these you know good things about Bitcoin, like fast, easy, efficient, uh, you know, like um, you know, super valuable. And then so yeah, I could I could see he kind of like dug himself into a hole. As soon as he got the go ahead, so I can see kind of the shot editor's... himself in the foot right yeah. after he got permission. Yeah, I, I can see you. I can see the editor's point of view. But one, he also could have been a better editor. You know, he could have read the article and been like, "Look, you're obviously taking a bi- a, a pro Bitcoin bias. You need to change this." Um, but then also, uh, he, the editor also, or I should say, the website in general, um, made Tim Lee put his existing invest his existing wealth into bitcoin he put two thousand dollars of his own money into bitcoin um and this you know this kind of brings me to my position i think i'm you know somewhat of an exceptionally rare case in the bitcoin economy because i've never bought a single um one single bitcoin like of any any amount like not even like point zero zero one i've never bought any bitcoins at all um, all the Bitcoin I own has come from working, uh, writing for Bitcoin news websites. Um, yeah. And I have I have no desire to try to um, sway readers in one direction or another because I have nothing to lose because I've not like I didn't put any of my existing wealth into it. Right. Um, so if Bitcoin dies tomorrow, the only thing I've lost is time. Hmm. Uh, you know, and, and I enjoy, and I enjoy doing this, so it's not really a big you know, lost to me because I've still had all that fun. So, you know, in, instead of instead of forcing Tim Lee to put $2,000 of his own money in Bitcoin, why why didn't Vox just say like, okay, you know, we're going to pay like 5% of your salary or you know, like 5% of the views you get or however he gets paid for his articles in Bitcoin and you can experiment with it like that. You're not, and you're not going to lose anything if the Bitcoin price goes down because you're not investing any of your wealth in it. Um, yeah. You know, they they could have done that, and then there would be like literally, essentially no incentive to try to you know pump Bitcoin or like skew his, the reports in any way. Um, yeah. I, yeah, I think I think Vox went around, went about this like completely like just in a terrible way. Yeah, I like I like your editor, your point about editing the article. Like, that's the editor's job, isn't it? 
to read over the article, make sure that everything makes sense, that it's you know decent quality, and that if it strikes them as too biased in favor of Bitcoin or whatever, then tell them to change it. Like, uh, yeah, that that that's that's a great point actually. Like, even if people are biased, it's the editor's job to take that bias out of the articles if it's not supposed to be there. You know? Yeah, like. The, the editor is is supposed to you know uphold the integrity of the website because you you have all these writers um of they're you know they're individual human beings of course they're gonna have their own opinions that are you know like not not tied to the, the company or news. the website yeah. or whatever they work for so it you know it yeah it's the editor's job to make sure that the personal opinions of the writers don't uh, you know, diminish the integrity of the website company or whatever. You know, Dustin, he, he's the editor for CoinBrief. He's, you know, there have been several occasions where he's well, like looked over my articles and he's like, look, you know, this is, you know, too much speculation, too much conjecture. You're being way too aggressive. Like, you need to change this. Like, you know, okay, it's his website. You know, he's he's paying me. I have to pay play by his rules. So, yeah, yeah you know, you, you could always just be a better editor. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Instead of like, instead of trying to engineer like engineer neutrality out of your writers, right? They're trying to make sure that the writers are as unbiased as 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 humanly possible. Will like take that to ex to the extreme, right? And like, okay, get rid of your Bitcoin, get rid of your dollars because you might be in favor of the U.S. economy too much. <laughs> get rid of yeah. your MacBook because you might be in favor of Apple too much. <laughs> You know, get get rid of your uh, iPhone because you'll be in favor of Apple. Get rid of your if you have an Android, get rid of that too because you might like Google too much, right? So I mean, we've got to use these tools. We have these great tools to help us uh, help us transact in the economy better and be more productive in ways that were never possible before the 21st century, and like let people use their tools. Computers are useful. The internet's useful. Bitcoin is useful. Uh, let people use it. And if they want to buy some of it too, let them. It's a learning experience. How are they going to learn about it if they don't get some and start transacting with it? So I don't know. You know People got to let editors got to let their writers have a little bit more freedom. I think. You know what really what really got me about this was, um, you know, well one it was like a matter of hours. They they reversed their decision like within a few hours after the original article got published. And also what really got me was that they made him sell his bitcoins he put two thousand dollars in the bitcoins they made him sell all of that and they wouldn't they're not even going to let him keep any profit he makes from it he has to donate, donate any yeah. profit he makes to charity you know <laughs> so he doesn't even have any say over what he does with the returns he got from the investment that he made from his own wealth yeah well, to be fair, that, he probably didn't make really anything off of it anyway. I mean, the Bitcoin price is, has been either yeah, going it's, down it's, slightly or been steady at 475 or so for the past few days. So if anything, yeah. he might have lost a little bit on it. Yeah, for for the past week, it's been, you know, it's been hovering between like 470, 490. Um, so yeah, if you bought the Bitcoins like yesterday, uh, I think yesterday it was like around 7 or, I mean, 490 for you know maybe a few hours so yeah he probably lost money yeah uh, and then he gets but, dollars but in he, return again like like why not yeah. let him buy something on overstock you know if yeah, he's gonna get rid of him anyway buy something cool with it yeah I, th I think vox really messed up uh you know hopefully hopefully they'll get enough flack for it and they'll kind of like maybe they'll at least let him keep the dude's profit let the dude keep his profit yeah but you know my 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 overall like perspective on this so far right, right now is just uh, news websites got to make their own calls and you know Tim Lee he's a free individual if he wanted to he can go work for someone else and make bitcoin somewhere else he can keep his investments private if he wants to and like I made this point on Twitter he can he can go on uh jobs for bitcoin subreddit and make some money on there and doesn't have to invest any of his personal wealth in, wealth into it, you know. It's people got to think outside the box, basically. Think outside the box and and look at ways where you can 
spread your tentacles all over the place and make bitcoins. Yeah, this is we are talking about bitcoins here. You know, if you you know if you have if you have the the USD mindset going into bitcoins, you you're not going to get very far. You have to think outside the box because Bitcoin is outside of the box. Oh yeah, very far outside the box. Uh, so speaking of boxes, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, no, no. Actually, no. I can I can make this transition. Speaking of boxes, uh, you know what else comes in boxes? Books. You know what you can buy with books now? <laughs> Bitcoin at the MIT bookstore. So. Um, <laughs> As as many in the Bitcoin community have known, uh, MIT Bitcoin Club is, has distributed a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin to all the MIT students, and there was you know some minor criticisms in the past, like oh well, what are they going to buy with a Bitcoin now? You know, classic criticism of Bitcoin. What do you what can you buy with it? Well, specifically on the MIT campus now, you can buy uh, classroom books and textbook material with it. Uh, at the MIT bookstore, which is called the Co-op, I believe. So, yeah, I mean, not, not only is the MIT Bitcoin Club doing great, like, awesome experimentive, uh, experimenting work on, like, possibly creating new applications and exploring the possibilities of the code, but now the students actually have a way to use it as a currency and buy stuff with it that they actually need for classes. So, great progress on the MIT campus this week. Yeah, and if I if I understood this correctly, um, I think I think I saw this in the article I read about it. Um, the MIT Co-op, you know, which is the bookstore, it's it's actually a private bookstore. Uh, you know, it's not it's not owned by um, by MIT. They just have, you know they have like a contract with you know the textbook publishers that the school works with and everything, but it's privately owned. So, and I think I read something about them having like. Um, they, the, some representative from the bookstore is like, yeah, we've been running an exchange out of the bookstore for a while. I think they might have been talking about an ATM. Um, oh, yeah. But, but yeah, so it's you know pretty interesting because there's this whole like you know Bitcoin project contest going on at MIT. Everybody has like a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin, um, and now like you know this. I'm sure I'm sure there's like some private things going on, like some of the students are you know like selling some weed for bitcoins or something. But yeah. you know this is this is the first like official like little you know there's like a little MIT Bitcoin economy starting up on campus. It started you know starting with this bookstore. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, it's great to see that the the actual institution is supporting it. You know, even if even if the bookstore isn't like. Uh, owned by the university itself if they're just like working con it's still it's still like a major like outlet on the campus like i i went to san jose state university and like they had their own like separate bookstore um like there was a main bookstore on campus and then there was like a separate bookstore off campus as well like if 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 either of those had started accepting bitcoin like that would have been huge news that would have been great and like yeah, you're right. Like people are probably uh, transacting Bitcoin between themselves, person to person, anyway. In in some cases, like, oh, you got some extra food? Like, I'll give you <laughs> I'll give you some bits for for some fries or whatever. Like, I can imagine that's yeah. probably happening. But now they have like a a way to actually get probably expensive materials for Bitcoin. And there's probably some I bet there's some students on campus as well who don't care that much about Bitcoin. And they're like, I'm not gonna use this weird digital currency uh but now those types of people will have a way to just exchange a large amount of their hundred dollars of free bitcoin for textbooks immediately and get something they they really need for classes and like yeah, in a way very, yeah go ahead at the, at the very least i'll get a free textbook out of it right 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 or get like a huge discount on a textbook that was like 150 dollars now they've got basically a 66 percent discount on that on that textbook thanks to uh the mit uh university and thanks to the mit bitcoin club and thanks to bitcoin itself so yeah um uh you know in in other college cryptocurrency news um this week new york university and duke university which are 
two of the largest and most popular colleges in the United States are now offering cryptocurrency courses uh, through their curriculum and teaching students about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, which is fantastic. That's that's great. I mean, we finally see we finally see higher education uh, educating people about the new system of money that could possibly uh, become very mainstream in the near future. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure if like they're taking a particular angle on it. Like if they're focusing on the programming aspects or if they're focusing on the economic aspects, I mean, it's pretty, it's a complicated platform, a lot to look at, but the fact that they're studying it in the first place and probably getting the basics down of, you know, how the blockchain works and maybe how cryptographic hash functions work, uh, that's great. That's great news because we need people to be educated about this. And it's not always easy. In fact, it's it's pretty much never easy to go online and learn about this stuff, right? Like n now we have professional professors um, teaching students in a formalized way how this works. Yeah, I'm looking at the Coindesk article right now. And um, the class that's being offered at NYU is called the law and business of Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. So, um, and it's said, it's a, a series of 14 sessions and, um, and part of the class covers the fundamental of money, the fundamentals of money. Huh. So it seems like, uh, you know, a little bit of focus on like maybe some basic monetary theory or something. I don't know, but, um, just judging by the title of the class, it, it'll be like regulation. Um, you know, since it's, New York University, there might be an interesting discussion on um, New York's bit license. Yes. Um, and then the Duke, um, the Duke classes, uh, it's called, the one at Duke is called Innovation, Disruption, and Crypto Ventures. And it says it will focus on the potential of businesses that use the blockchain. And it's going to be available to students next spring. So, okay, so yeah, interesting. That's uh, business class. I would be more interested in NYU's basically because there's a potential for some, you know, economics there, uh -huh. which I'm a huge economics nerd. So uh, you know, that's that's actually with that news. That's a, that's a little bit disappointing then, because I was I was hoping that uh, it would more focus on the cryptography behind the blockchain and how the underlying system works. Cause like, I think that's more important to learn in the first place before you move on to the other stuff. Because if you don't, if you don't really understand how the blockchain itself works, then it might not matter whether you can create a business or, around Bitcoin because, well, how are you, how are you going to, how are you going to capitalize on the blockchain if you don't know how it works? Yeah, if you, you know, you can build a business without knowing, like, you know, the intricacies of Bitcoin, but at the same time, if you go into a business, a Bitcoin business, knowing nothing about Bitcoin, and then you use Bitcoin as the same way you would use dollars, then what are you really gaining from it? Right. So, yeah, yeah, I agree that they're, that they should have, you know, at least given, like, a basic overview of how um, Bitcoin works. It, maybe that's something they would consider in the future, depending on the success uh, or the popularity of the class. They might have like they might integrate it into like their computer science curriculums, yeah, and you know, their computer science departments or something like that. That's that would, where the real cool. innovation is going to happen is is in the actual code in in the computer science. Like, I mean, we have we have plenty of businesses in this space already, and we could always use more, of course, uh, more choices to choose from in, in where to store your bitcoins, where to transact them, where to spend them. But like the actual world changing innovation is going to happen by computer scientists and developers who you know create create new functions on the blockchain that had never been thought up before. And apparently, those people aren't necessarily going to be created by NYU or Duke in the near future. Yeah, that's where the big money is too, right? Like we like we were just talking about this, you know, a few minutes ago. Uh, you know, you know the difference between um, freelance work for uh, programming and coding and freelance work and you know writing is, 
you know, pretty significant. Yeah. So, you know, if you can learn, if you have, you know, these computer science students who are learning the fundamentals of, uh, of Bitcoin, you know, then they can go and find one of these, these, you know, Bitcoin companies that are looking, they're always looking for developers and they're gonna, you know, they can have a pretty su successful career, you know, yeah. based on Bitcoin. So hopefully, hopefully these classes get popular. Uh, the article, the Coindesk article says uh, that at NYU, 35 people attended the first session. Pretty you good. Know, not, you know, yeah, not bad. Um, so That's a good size hopefully, class. Yeah, hopefully it'll take off. Yeah, you know, I guess I guess this kind of highlights the the fact that you know MIT, the MIT Bitcoin Club is the ones who are really going towards innovating on top of the blockchain. And if that's the type of thing that you want to do in terms of Bitcoin, then you've got a decision to make about which which you know northeastern university you're gonna go to. If you're focused on the business and law aspects, which you know, as we've said, it's a little bit, little bit more, less interesting, I mean, uh, than the computer science aspects. But if you like the law and business, then go to Duke or NYU. But if you're interested in actually innovating, like, brand new financial tools that, you know, don't necessarily fit into existing laws, then MIT is probably the college to go to, to for Bitcoin innovation. Yeah, also keep in mind, too, that... Um business and law especially the law aspect of bitcoin um extremely temporary right oh, yeah. if if bitcoin if bitcoin meets its reaches its full potential um a lot of the legal confusion surrounding it right now is just going to you know go away um, yeah it's kind of in flux I, right now yeah, like I, I recently wrote an article that you know was pretty well received, like about why Bitcoin, sh like why we shouldn't be trying to fit Bitcoin to existing legal structures, um, and um, you know there's all these organizations coming out now, you know stressing the need for regulation and that we like we need to integrate it into um, you know existing legal and financial structures so it can get staying power, but um, like we're we're just in an intermediary period right now. Like they want to regulate the exchanges and things like that because those are like the, the points like, of failure. Right? Yeah, the points of failure, um, access points for most people. Um, but it's just temporary. Right. You know the exchanges aren't gonna be around forever because once everybody has Bitcoin um, and they don't want dollars anymore, there won't be a need to buy and sell Bitcoin because you can you just. Yeah. sell your goods and, or, bu or buy things with bitcoin so and even before we get to that point like uh, we're gonna pretty soon we're gonna have wallets where you can not only store your bitcoin but buy bitcoin within the wallet itself i think circle is basically trying to create a, a product like that where you know you'll basically be able to open up your smartphone app and buy bitcoin with either your credit or debit card or maybe even like PayPal account or something, it'll go into your wallet right there and it'll be like ready to use, you know, instantly. It's, companies are trying to create that service right now. So, I mean, already exchanges are kind of starting to become a little bit obsolete unless you're really into the day trading kind of thing. Yeah, and also um, people are already working on decentralized exchanges. There are already some that are around, I think, but... Uh, like I've seen people talking about them on Reddit, and uh, and but they said like the exchange rates are really bad on those. I guess just because they're not that popular. Um, but you know, if you have a decentralized exchange, you literally can't regulate it because there's no central point of failure or a central point of control or anything like that. You, what law are you going to pass to regulate a decentralized exchange that's completely autonomous? Yeah, just like it's, how you know, Bitcoin's a decentralized currency, yeah, you can't so regulate we're, the blockchain. We're, you know, like this, the whole legal aspect that we're like making this huge fuss over right now, it's just, it's totally temporary. And, um, you know, it's, it, we're kind of like in this transitory, like limbo state right now where, um, you know, our economy is like, it, it's like starting kind of halfway to become like this hybrid between fiat and Bitcoin. 
because people want Bitcoin, but you can't really buy anything with it. So you have to constantly like switch back and forth between the two. Um, you know, but but that's you just can because buy hella it's stuff new. now. Yeah, yeah, that's just because it's new. Like over time, you know, you're not gonna have to sell uh, bitcoins for fiat or buy them with fiat. You know, you're, you're gonna get your paycheck in Bitcoin, and then you can go to the store and buy whatever in Bitcoin, or even pay your rent in Bitcoin down the line. Yeah, so I don't, I don't get why people are so like, they're so stressed out over like fitting it into the legal structures and you know just putting all these resources into it and it's just they're ultimately they're ultimately just going to be you know like fruitless efforts because you know they're not really going to get anything out of it because it's not going to stay this way forever yeah so um speaking of regulation uh there was an article that came out on coindesk last week where uh a google analyst uh like financial analyst who who works with google a lot uh, he wrote a paper on Bitcoin. Uh, you know, he supported the idea of regulation, but kind of made a distinction between um, Bitcoin businesses, which should be regulated, and the uh, Bitcoin users, which should not be regulated. Um, what was your overall takeaway from this report that that this Google analyst wrote? Yeah, I actually uh, took the time out to. Um read his full article that he wrote on the Internet Policy Review because I'm going to be planning on writing a response to it uh, to be published on CoinBrief. And this guy, um, his name is Andy Yi. He works for he works as an analyst for Google's Asia-Pacific division. Um, and basically what he said was he used this, um, this idea that was created by these two authors in 2004 of um, like the the he broke it down he broke the internet they these guys broke the internet down into layers uh so there was like like an onion yeah there was like a like like a physical layer um like an access layer and then there's an information layer and a user layer and so um so the the very the most basic layer, the very bottom one, uh, ye called the logical layer, is where all the innovation takes place. It's, it's just like the internet protocol is just a basic platform where any kind of application can be developed, kind of like Ethereum. And then you have the physical layer, which would be like the access points, the internet service providers, uh, like the hardware required to run the internet protocol and things like that. And then you have the information layer, which is where the applications are being developed, these websites are being created, online stores are being created. Then you have the user layer, which is you know consumers, um, business people actually running their businesses and things like that. And he took that, which you know I, I've thought about that you know in terms of the internet, it actually makes a lot of sense. But then he took that and applied it to Bitcoin, and he's like, okay. So Bitcoin is the logical layer. It's like the internet protocol. And then we have, uh, you know, the, the development layer where it's like all th these people are like adding all these things on top of Bitcoin. And you have the information layer. And these are the, this is where like all the, like the illicit activities are being or businesses are being developed like Silk Road, terrorist finance, blah, blah, blah. And then the user layer, which is people like me and you, and we buy and things with Bitcoin, we'd sell our services uh, for Bitcoin. And he was like, all of the above layers need to be regulated, but the very bottom uh, logical layer needs to remain unregulated so the developers can, you know, do whatever they want without being restricted. Okay. Um, I take issue with that because, you know, he, I think it's a, I think he it was a false equivalency between Bitcoin and the internet. I think he um, I think he mistakenly linked Bitcoin and blockchain technology and treated them as one thing, uh, but but that's not the case. You have the blockchain, which can be used for you know literally anything, but then you have Bitcoin, um, which is specifically a monetary technology, um, specifically a payment system with a currency. It just happens to operate on a blockchain, and so he he was basically saying keep the blockchain unregulated, but regulate everything else. Um, 
but you you can't you can't do that with Bitcoin. Um, one because the blockchain is capable of so many things, and that the layers that he used, uh, the internet layers that he used, don't really apply to Bitcoin because those layers are kind of blurred by Bitcoin, because you can kind of transition on um, Bitcoin between those layers, because um, basically it's decentralized. Is is the the whole point this is what I'm trying to get at here because the internet is centralized at the point of access, so you can you can regulate the gatekeepers, which is what Andy Yee called things like, uh, which is what he called the exchanges. They're the gatekeepers, and you have to regulate the gatekeepers. But you can't do that with Bitcoin because all these things that seem you know monolithic and cent like centralized points of access, uh, you know, they're actually not, and you can decentralize them all on the blockchain, and it's going to happen. So. Um, you know, it's literally Im impossible to provide, to enact any kind of, you know, lasting regulation to Bitcoin um, simply because it's decentralized and, you know, that, that layer theory doesn't really apply to Bitcoin is what I took from it. Yeah, it sounds to me that, like, you, I mean, it's an interesting type of analysis to do to try and make sense of the situation and try and apply, like, a reasonable... Regu type of regulation to it and what should be regulated or not but at the end of the day it's really hard to break up bitcoin into layers because there is no clear-cut line between this group of users and this group of developers and this group of you know business people right a user can be can start up their own business any day right with with the right amount of like support and and funding and uh, skills and expertise, a user can can become a business person, or if they learn the developing skills, they can become a developer. It, or you know, it, there's there's all kinds of gray areas in between, and, and it's it's all mixing together into this brand new type of ecosystem, and like if it and and that doesn't even take into account the 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 fact that if you did decide to regulate like a small layer of business groups. Um, that doesn't even take into account th that, you know, that restricts the free market uh, of businesses should be able to do what whatever they want to satisfy the customer. And if they if they mess up, then, you know, their customers learn that and stop using them and and they go out of business. Uh, so, I mean, there's there's like I'm, I'm nitpicking a little bit with with this type of analysis. I think it's I'm glad that he wrote it i think we do need more in-depth analysis like this from people who have influential positions at companies like google but we shouldn't take them as you know as like this 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 great like amazing like thing that we should all believe like oh wow they they nailed it like this is the this is the right way to regulate let's divide everything up into clear distinct layers and no one can you know be in two layers at once because <laughs> it, it's that's too complicated like um it's interesting to think about but we we i don't think that you can divide the ecosystem into clear-cut layers and you know we got to be careful to not try and do that because that's a really serious oversimpli oversimplification of the ecosystem yeah his like his main point was that um anything that has to do with the consumer aspect needs to be regulated so like exchanges which he called gatekeepers because those are points of access to Bitcoin and then businesses but then you keep the blockchain it's or he didn't actually call it the blockchain he just said you keep Bitcoin itself unregulated so the innovators can develop all these all these um, projects and and services and products on the Bitcoin platform and then, you know, let open it up for people to use. Uh, but that's not how Bitcoin works. Like, right. Like, you know, these these gatekeepers he talks about, they're not rigid and they're not constant. The ex like the exchanges, like we were just talking about, um, people are people are starting to decentralize the exchanges. Um, and, you know, like I said, he mistakenly connected the blockchain technology in general and Bitcoin. He combined those as one technology, which you, you can't do because there are countless different currencies that use blockchain technology, but they're not Bitcoin. And um, 
well, you know, one of his main arguments for keeping the blockchain itself deregulated was that it's fully traceable because the blockchain is a public ledger of every transaction. Well, um, Cody Wilson and Amir Taki are working on Dark Wallet, which is going to be implementing fully anonymized uh, Bitcoin payments um, through payment mixing. So you can't tr track your transactions on the blockchain. And then there's an altcoin called uh, Darkcoin. Um, and its main feature is that um, th there's a setting on the wallet where you can anonymize your transactions and they don't show up on the blockchain. So... Yeah, what layer do those fall into, Yeah, right? what layer is that, Andy Yee? Like, um, yeah. and, and another... There's, there's another example that I thought of as well, like um, uh, Satoshi Dice, which is like pretty much the first gambling website that was created for Bitcoin. Um, they utilize the blockchain to allow people to, you know, uh, gamble gamble with small amounts of bitcoin or large amounts if they want to uh you know what is what does that fall under like what i mean does that does that classify as a business is that regulated but it's on the blockchain it's it's a specific type of tool that was developed on the blockchain directly um which is you know kind of controversial in in, in the community a little bit because it creates a lot of kind of spammy transactions as people roll the dice constantly on the blockchain but for our point here like uh what what layer is that you know that's that's one of those that's like on the on the outside of it it appears like a business it's it's a gambling website that you know makes some profit so in that way it's a business but then it's also a tool that's built into the blockchain itself the thing with bitcoin is businesses can be directly on the blockchain now and you can't divide that in a lot of cases yeah another big uh, mistake he made was that um he said the most important thing about Bitcoin was not the monetary aspect of Bitcoin, but the development platform that Bitcoin provided. So it's so he's basically saying uh, Bitcoin isn't about the currency, but it's about the things that can be built on top of the blockchain. Well, that that comes from you know combining the blockchain in general and Bitcoin, the currency, into one inseparable technology. Um, which totally is not the case at all. Um, but, you know, I would argue that the most important thing about Bitcoin are the actual Bitcoins because, it, you know, it actually changed the way, you know, finance is conducted. It, you know, yeah. it changed money. So, um, and in the process, yes, yeah, Satoshi developed this blockchain, which can be used for like an infinite amount of other things. Um, but you know, I'm like I said, I'm going to be writing an article about it. So you know, listeners and viewers, you know, like definitely encourage you to to look out for the article and read it because I'll be explaining my positions, you know, much more clearly, and they'll make a lot more sense. If your um, article is out by the time I upload this individual clip of Andy Yee's paper, then I, I can put it in the description for people for people to look okay. at. Okay. Well, that. I'm I'm going to start on it tonight, and it should be finished, you know, by tomorrow. So, um, right. but yeah, like my. You know, my my message to Andy Yee is that, you know, learn a little bit more about Bitcoin. Uh, it doesn't seem like you really know what it is, because um, these internet layers, while they're definitely interesting when applied to the internet, um, don't really make a whole lot of sense with Bitcoin, because Bitcoin is just not centralized in the same way that the internet is. So it can't be governed in the same way that the internet is. It's two different things. They both de they both help decentralize, um, you know, services and functions that were originally centralized in society. But it's it's two it's two very separate things. And and you know the blockchain doesn't even necessarily need to be on the internet. Uh, it can be broadcasted from radio towers. It can be broadcasted <laughs> from satellites. You know so. They're they're they they're two very separate things. Yeah, and plus my last point is that um, that layer tech that layer theory, while it's really interesting and um, you know it's pretty valid for internet in its current state, as the internet becomes even more decentralized through things like Tor and you know even more sophisticated um, networks that are being developed, like MadeSafe, I think is one. Mm -hmm. um, 
once the internet itself is decentralized, uh, this layer theory won't even apply to the internet. Mm. So, um, hmm. yeah, and, and plus this theory is 10 years old. It was, these guys wrote this paper or whatever it is, wherever this medium this uh, theory was broadcast on in 2004. So it's, it's 10 years old, much so older than Bitcoin. A lot has changed since then. Yeah, much older than Bitcoin. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's a really uh, valid theory to apply to Bitcoin, especially when we're talking about regulating it because it just doesn't work the same as the Internet. Yeah. Um, okay, great discussion. So I think that uh, pretty much covers it for this week's batch of news. Uh, we'll see you guys next week, and be sure to check out coinbrief.net. Um, follow us on Twitter, like this video, subscribe to the Coinbrief YouTube channel. And yeah, we'll, we'll see you guys next week with some, uh, some brand new um, content and brand new news. Uh, also, check out my interview with... Um, with the project manager of the bit drop, um, Sarah Blinko, um, it should be uploaded by, it should be uploaded before the podcast. Uh, so check that out on the Coinbrief YouTube channel. And yeah, we'll see you guys next week with some more, so with some more news in the cryptocurrency space. Uh, this has been the Coinbrief podcast episode number 14. And uh, this is your source for digi your open source for digital currency news. And yeah, we'll see you guys next week.